today I take my revenge against Sony. Because, you see, if you've been around my channel, you might have seen the steering wheel I made to play racing games. At first I intended to use it for my PS4, but what do you know? Sony really wants you to use and buy, yeah mainly buy, their $60 controllers and not some actually affordable custom controller or heck even an Xbox controller if you already have one. And how do they ensure this? Well they force the controller to do a complicated cryptographic handshake for which you need some cryptographic keys. Guess who's the only one who can give you those keys? And guess where they put them? Anyway, the fact is, due to all these requirements, nobody has made a library for Arduino, TNC or ESP32 to be able to communicate with a PS4. But I wasn't just gonna accept defeat. A few months after making the steering wheel, I decided it was time for a rematch. Because my brother has been really into this bicycle game recently, and when I saw this crusty old stationary bike from 2013 collecting dust in his room as a full-time job, I had an idea. I would create the pinnacle of making exercise genuinely fun. I would turn my bike into a controller. So I had a second try at researching, but this time I broadened my horizons, with no specific board in mind yet. Because this had been my mistake last time, I was looking up software for the Arduino Leonardo, which is what I already had. However, not long after, a ray of hope shined through my screen. Literally. I found GP2040 CE, and it looked very promising. GP2040 CE is a firmware that, instead of being for AVR boards like the Arduino, is meant to be used on boards with the RP2040 microcontroller, like the Raspberry Pi Pico, and it said it's compatible with heck darn near everything. It also had a bunch of features, but at this point I was thinking there had to be a catch, as with all the other possibilities I'd found so far. And I ended up finding it. Or did I? In the frequently asked questions, they address PS4 compatibility. Specifically, they talk about this 8 minute timeout. Turns out, because of this authentication requirement, your controller would be refused every 8 minutes, which is when the checks happen, unless you did one of two things get a USB pass-through dongle, or get some authentication keys. And here's where Sony starts playing Monopoly again. A USB pass-through dongle is a device you plug into your controller to allow it to perform the necessary authentication with the PS4. And it turned out the Pico was only like 5 bucks, so hey, maybe I could spend a couple more on one of these to make my life easier. Oh, are you kidding me? So as I started looking into how I could get some authentication keys to put into the device, Things only got shadier by the minute. For some reason, the Discord gives the biggest North Korea vibes I've ever seen. As soon as the topic arises, they'll just go, yeah, let's stop talking about this, and just awkwardly end the conversation. In fact, I got banned for indirectly referencing this. Like, damn, that's pretty messed up. So I resorted to the internet and went down obscure Reddit threads, which led me to actual pastebin sites. Yeah, the ones that also have all those leaked passwords and very much non-family friendly things where I could finally find some plausible instructions. But why so much shadiness? Well, as it turns out, according to Sony's legal terms, you may not reverse engineer, decompile or disassemble system software, create derivative works or attempt to create source code from a subject code. You may not 1. Use any unauthorized, illegal, counterfeit or modified hardware or software with it and 2. Use tools to bypass, disable or circumvent any PS4 system encryption, security or authentication mechanism. Need I continue? But no, actually it gets worse. It also says you cannot assist or encourage any third party to do so or acquire or use any materials from any third party that does so. In other words, nobody can give me the keys, I must not extract the keys and if I did I'd be in big trouble and if I taught you guys how to extract the keys, I'd be in even bigger trouble. So it seemed neither the pass-through dongle nor the keys were viable options. But you know what? My previous attempt didn't work at all. So if I can actually communicate with my PlayStation, I think we can deal with real time out every now and then. In fact, I thought of a possible solution which you might have in mind right now too. But we could figure that out later. Anyway, with the software decided, I ordered a Raspberry Pi Pico. Now it was time to plan my design. I needed two main things. A controller with all the buttons I'd need, which should be easy, I'd done it before with my steering wheel, and a way to measure when and how fast someone was pedaling the bike. To see how I could do it, I took it apart to see its inside, 
I had two wheels, one directly connected to the pedals and a heavy flywheel at the back which spun faster. Now I could think of a few ways to measure rotational speed. I could use a motor which produces a measurable voltage when you spin it manually, although none of the axles were exposed so I'd have to place it in contact with one of the wheels, maybe with a small rubber wheel, but the voltage is practically undetectable until a certain speed and I needed more sensitivity. I could also use an IR sensor, seeing that the flywheel had some holes, so I could maybe place a reflecting element on the other side or just use a distance measuring IR sensor and detect when the sensor spin was led through by the flywheel's holes, which would happen a specific number of times every revolution. This was plausible, but soon I found a much better option. You see, what many stationary bikes do is place magnets along a wheel and then use a magnetic sensor to detect when they pass by. And what do you know? There it was! A red switch mounted on the structure and some metals placed along the pedal wheel. In fact, I might just be able to use this existing system. However, after some tests, I realized the red switch was deader than 419 2025, so I decided to use my own. Now, a common problem with red switches is debouncing, which is exactly what it sounds like. The metal contacts bounce before completely closing, and this can generate extra unneeded signals. However, interestingly, I found that if I approached the magnet from the side instead of from the front, the debouncing went away. Another option I tried was a Hall effect sensor, which is fancier because it's solid state with no moving parts, but it was giving me crazy noise and extra signals, so I just went with the reach switch. I also didn't trust the existing magnets, and there were only two in the entire wheel, so I ruthlessly sought them out and placed four neodymium magnets I had instead. And my spin detection setup was done. Now it was onto the button layout. I tried to make the setup as compact as possible, trying not to go over the existing panel size, and came up with this. Options on the touch panel on the left, PS more in the middle, L1 and R1 at the top, the AOXO buttons on the right, and the joysticks will go on the handles. R2, the trigger to accelerate, would be my spin setup, of course, and I decided to make L2 the trigger to brake into an actual brake. So I decided to start with the brake. I got this brake lever model from Thingiverse and came up with this simple mechanism, where one side of the brake's axle is meant to go through the hole in a potentiometer to measure its angle. I also added some protrusions here to place a spring so it would pull it back up. Then, once the Pico arrived, I took its measurements and started designing the case. It's heavily inspired on the one I made for the steering wheel, especially the bottom board, and it made it incredibly compact, only constrained by the Pico's dimensions. I was also careful to design it to be able to put it together easily once I had the wiring done, and added some holes for screws to mount it on the bike. So while that was printing, I decided to start setting up GP2040 CE. After reading through the docs, which by the way are unnecessarily complicated to navigate and for some reason rely heavily on the text search tool, I came to the conclusion that I'd have to modify the source code for the firmware to make an add-on for the speed measurement system. Ok, intense start. However, it turned out there wasn't really a guide for how to code an add-on, plus they were in C++, which I've never really properly learned, so I had to go to the GitHub repo and decipher how the thing worked from the existing add-ons while learning the necessary syntax on the go. And once I thought I'd figured it out, I cloned the GitHub repo to be able to build my own firmware, added the files for my add-on to it, and came up with this code. First, we have this header file with some dependencies, definition, processes and variables I use, and then we have the main file. So in the setup, I just initialize my pins and some of my variables, as well as getting the gamepad object and setting analog triggers to true. Basically, so they're not just 1 or 0, and I can actually modify the throttle and braking force. Then here's where my actual logic comes into play. So if the read switch is read as 1, so activated by a magnet, and the last read was different from 1, so 0, meaning that this will only trigger once every time a new magnet hits the switch, I calculate the RPM by dividing a minute by the time it took from the previous magnet to this one multiplied by 4, because remember I have 4 magnets. Then, this RPM variable is mapped and clamped from its original range, from 0 to this max RPM variable, which I temporarily set to 180, to the 0 to 255 range used by the triggers. The higher the max RPM, 
the faster you have to pedal to reach the full throttle. Also, if one second passed without a new magnet, so if you'd stop pedaling, the throttle is set back to zero. But don't be mistaken, I arrived at this after a lot of debugging and errors when building, especially because, as it turned out, the guide on how to implement an add-on you've made into the firmware had a tremendous mistake. I told the guys at the Discord server, so yeah, hopefully they'll correct that. And once I finally managed to get the build to complete without errors, I had my firmware UF2 file ready to flash into my Pico. So once the button board had been printed, I made a temporary wiring setup to test it. I needed common ground and VCC, so I tried a new technique I came up with of soldering all the cables together and sandwiching the solder between two nickel strips which I welded together using a spot welder. Although I ended up replacing one of them with just some headers soldered together. Then, using the GP2040C web configurator tool, I mapped all my pins to the buttons and even added a hotkey for rebooting. This meant that if I reached the 8 minute timeout, all I'd need to do was press the options and touchpad buttons at the same time and keep playing. Also, joysticks were not unlocked by default for some weird reason, so I had to set that as well. But there was something I hadn't thought of, because I only had 4 analog pins, and if I used one for each joystick axis, I wouldn't be able to use one for my break. And this meant a sacrifice had to be made. So I just ditched the left Y axis, it's practically useless, all you use it for in the senders is to lean forward or backward, which does basically nothing. But then, while wiring the rest of the joystick pins, I realized there was no pin 29! I had been trolled! So anyway, right X axis goes bye bye, does the same thing as the left X axis. Also, I set the unused joystick axis to the middle value so they wouldn't cause any trouble. So once I tested all the buttons and the read switch system, well, sort of, because web based testers suck, and once the brake finished printing, it was time to test that. I installed the potentiometer in its place and assembled the whole thing using a spring I got from a Roomba suspension system. Because remember that huge blackout that happened in Spain back in April? Well, while everyone was panicking going around buying supplies like it was the apocalypse, I was taking apart a Roomba. But anyway, then I ran into a problem, because the little axle kept breaking. What could I do? And that's when I realized it had this very perfect hexagonal shape. So I printed one with a hole instead, and now had a reliable axle for my potentiometer. However, when going to configure it in GP2040CE, it turns out potentiometer range adjustment isn't a thing. So back to my code I went to add that to my add-on. I used one of the Pico's analog pins, pin 26, to measure the potentiometer's voltage, and I also added this mapping function which I'd have to calibrate. So after that, I decided to close the case and found myself trying to compress this absolute nightmare fuel into such a masterfully compact case. So I had to use a heat gun, which totally isn't just my mom's hair dryer, to soften the cables and then close the lid and forget about it forever. So with the case closed, I installed it on the bike with some screws and it was time for the first gameplay test. Yeah, maybe I went a bit overboard with the max RPM. I reduced it to 60 to see the effect, but it still wouldn't move very quickly. I then reduced it to 30, and I started to notice something strange. I soon kept hitting a kind of speed limit for some reason. However, when I tried it on a web tester, the trigger was apparently being fully pressed. So what was going on? Well, as I found out, the left trigger's value was basically nonsense and I couldn't figure out why. I was ready to take the case apart in case it was a bad connection, except I wasn't ready at all to do that, but luckily I found out it was actually the analog joystick add-on messing with it, as disabling it fixed the issue. I was about to take the joysticks into my own hands as well, but then I found the true root of the problem. Turns out you have to select a channel for the Pico's analog to digital converter, and I did that in my setup. However, as the joystick add-on changed channels constantly for each pin, it did it repeatedly in the main process, overriding mine and preventing me from ever measuring my break. So to fix it, I simply set the channel just before my measurement. So with all that working, I just needed to wait for my new joysticks to arrive, as I only had one left, and in the meantime, I decided to reassemble the bike. 
and once the joysticks arrived, I printed the cases for them and installed them on the bike. And when it was time for the final test, my right joystick wasn't behaving correctly. It was being pulled down to zero volts. Turns out the default LED configuration takes pin 28 by default, sending it to a pull down output pin. So watch out for that. And now, let's ride. Okay, I must say, I'm amazed at how well that worked. I only realized I was sweating when I'd already finished playing. I got so much fun both making and using my new device. And now that you know how to do it, why not try and make your own quirky controllers as well? In fact, I've got a rough idea of how I could maybe make it work on Arduino boards. So if I manage to do it, I'll definitely upload it as a library so you can all use it. Anyway. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe, as it took a lot of time and effort to make, and it helps me a ton. That's it, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.